five minutes or do we start now, Ron? We start now. Okay. Uh, got it. Let me. So, uh, good afternoon, um, friends and guests. Um, I'm Luya Sioche, and I will be the moderator, your moderator for today. It's nice to be back at the VIP table, but this time only as a moderator. And uh, it's a good thing that uh, we now have uh, Howie Calleja uh, pitching in for, uh, for President Michael Escalera. Don't worry, don't worry, Howie. We will make your three weeks stay as president, as acting, as officer in charge, very memorable and very significant, right? <laughs> and so it's so nice to see you all safe and dry. Uh, it's so fortunate that uh, we have uh, emerged from the typhoon unscathed. Uh, however, we received sad news and I hope that the past president, Fred Parunga, will also include him in his invocation. I'm speaking of John Palmiano, our very loyal messenger for 15 years. So, um, let me call now our Vice President, now President, Hoi Kalieha to call this meeting to order. Uh, by the power vested in me by Louis Asioche, <laughs> the Rotary Club of uh, Makati, I call this meeting to order. Thank you. That was the script also of President Michael. Past President Fred Parungao to uh, do the invocation. Uh, can we please rise for the invocation? Fellow Rotarians and guests, let us place ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Our merciful God, we come to you in our weakness. We come to you in our fear. We come to you in supplication. We come to you in trust. We come to you in our hope. Last Sunday, Lord, our country was battered by a very strong typhoon. We thank you, Lord, that Metro prepared from the brunt of the typhoon. We pray for our countrymen who suffered damages in other parts of the country. Please grant your mercy that they recover very quickly from the losses that they suffered. We thank you, Lord, that our Rotary Club is able to give assistance to those who are in need in cases of emergencies such as this. We pray that you continue to grant us the ability to render the needed assistance. Lord, we pray to you to guide our leaders in governing our country in these very difficult times. May we be spared from the military conflict that is happening at an alarming rate between Russia and Ukraine and the tensions between China on one hand and the U.S. and Taiwan on the other. We thank you, Lord, that our Rotary members are able to gather today, either face-to-face -face or via electronic means, to listen to our guest speaker. We pray that our guest speaker be given the grace to impart to us his very important message on his topic, disinformation, the challenge of our members, and our members to fully absorb this message. Lord, we also pray for our staff member, John Palmiano, who unexpectedly passed away suddenly last Sunday, September. May his soul rest in peace and may perpetual light shine upon him. Lastly, Lord, please bless all the members of our Rotary Club. May we continue to glorify you in everything that we do 
All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Past President Fred Parunga. Please remain standing for the national anthem to be followed by the R.C. Makati hymn. Okay, we are seeing a him. We go to the four-way test. Where is my kodigo? Memorize, memorize. The four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Please repeat after me. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And lastly, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. So the first of the road three way test, our guest speaker will speak on that. Is it the truth? Okay, for birthday salutations, can I have the list of, uh... okay. Those celebrating their birthdays, uh, number one, it will be Andy Manyalak, our crooner who dabbles in real estate. He will be celebrating his birthday on the 28th of September. And on the second day of October, our past president, Carlo Rufino, our bowler who disappeared at the last event, which is why we've lost. 
Happy birthday to Andy and past president Carlo. For our Rotary Ants, we have Marisa Concepcion who will be celebrating her birthday on September 27. I thought Toffee will be joining us because he has just arrived from Vancouver. And Alexa Oboitis on the 3rd of October. And one of our favorite aunts, the Aunt Tesha Garcia, who will be celebrating her birthday also on the 3rd of October. For wedding our anniversary, our dancing couple, Attorney Reggie and Say Juan Parada, happy anniversary on the 2nd of October. Now, may I call on past District Governor Tony Kila for the recognition of our Paul Harris Fellow, former first and Delhi up. I think Delhi's here. I just saw Delhi. Ah, okay. Or later. Okay. So we'll defer that for later. Now, uh, may I ask... Uh, Vice President Hoi Calleja to approach the signing table along with Director Philip Sullivan for the MOA signing of our Reef Buds project and the turnover of check to Mr. Benji Tayak, past president of RC Paranaque. Please join us in the MOA signing here. Come here. Yep. Uh, if Ferdi Ordovez is here already, is Ferdi Ordovez here? No, not yet. Who else should be here to, to act as witness? Yeah, Philip, Philip. I called on Philip. It's under the directorate of Philip Sullivan. So this Reef Buds project, um, we will be planting an initial 100 Reef Buds in our new site at uh, off the coast of Pagbilao, Quezon. And uh, this was a brainchild of uh, past of director Ferdi Ordovesa. Um, a group of Rotarians paid a visit there and uh, saw where the, where the reef buds would be planted. So can we train the camera on them? Did I hear you correctly, Philip, that uh, Benji gave us a discount for the reef buds, Philip? <laughs> okay, can we invite the gentleman to approach the uh, center? This will be the second reef bud project of the Rotary Club of Makati. The first one is at the Sea of Sulbeck in Narvacan. So can you can you show the your signed boa? For the picture taking, are they done? Not yet. <laughs> for, for how many reports? One hundred mm -mm. Okay. Okay. Can you approach the center? No way. Yes, yes, yes. So, gentlemen, can you approach the center for the uh, turnover of the check? For 400, this is for 400,000 partial payment for 100 reef buds. Um, we this this entire project 
would cost a total of 800,000. And as I overheard Director Philip mentioned a while back, he was he was uh, thanking Benji Tayag, past president Benji Tayag, RC Pananyake, for the discount he gave to our club. Thank you very much. Huh? There's the real check. <laughs> Thank you very much, past President Benji. Now, uh, let us acknowledge our dignitaries, guests, and visiting Rotarians. Joining us in person, of course, past District Governor, Mr. Paul Harris, Tony Kila. And then uh, I saw uh, Anne Yvette Yvonne Kwan here a while ago. Ah, Yvonne, yes, there you are. Hi. So Yvonne Kwan is here. And also joining us online, uh, Nelly Bengzon. And of course, my one and only Tessa Sioche. Our guest here with us today, Dr. Benjamin Campomanes, the Executive Vice President of St. Luke's Medical Center. Welcome. The president, the president of Rotaract, Makati. Nico de la Cruz. Hi, Nico. And then we have a special guest of director, Sunny Tambunting Jr., Miss Shello Tegaspi. Shello, can you please rise so that they can see you? Hi, welcome, Shello. Also from the Rotara Club of Makati, John Martin Revilla. John, welcome. Of course, I mentioned a while ago, past president Benji Tayag of the Reef Buds Project. He was a past pre president of RC Paranaque and the guest of past president Tito Panlilio, Mr. Victoria Lim. Victoria Lim. Hi. Hi, Vic. What's next? Okay. Oh, all right. We will go to the classification talk of one of our esteemed baby Rotarians. Uh, he is not... Um, uh, contrary to rumors, contrary to rumors, this uh, baby Rotarian is not snobbish. Hindi siya suplado. He just is legally blind. So may I call on Winston Uy? Winston Uy. To do his classification talk. Yep, here. Thanks so much, Louis, President. Um, being called a baby, I, I want to keep being called the baby for uh, more than a year, please. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for welcoming me. Uh, everybody's been so um, hospitable and, and be so friendly to me as a baby retire. And I'd like to thank everyone for that, please. Um, just, to, just to let you know more about me. First thing I want you to know about me is I am more than legally blind. I am I'm, I'm completely blind on my left eye, and my right eye has two very rare diseases in my retina that I cannot even recognize the food in my plate. So because of that, I'd like to apologize for everybody that I cannot rec I, I have a hard time remembering names because I cannot see faces unless you're this close. If you're this close, I might kiss you already. So, so, so I'd like everybody to know that and that I'm also very friendly, but I just cannot recognize. So because I cannot recognize, I'm always a little bit shy on approaching people because I because I don't remember your names and your faces. So please, I apologize for that. Just to not let you know a little bit about me. Um, well, I'm the president of Universal Leaf Philippines. Basically, my journey started back when I took over the company in 1994-95, the business of, we're in the tobacco growing, dealing business at that time. And we, we work with middlemen and tobacco has seen its better days in the 60s, 70s, 80s, as well as the 90s. And it was an industry in decline. And one of the bl blessings that I went through is I was 
invited as a very young man to the Senate hearing on general agreements on tariff and trade, which is the precursor for WTO. And it talked about a world that is, um, that is without borders, without protection. And, and I said, oh my God. So I, I, I took two steps back from my business and looked at the business and I said, oh my God, we're dead. At that time, you know, tobacco is just like all the agri uh, agriculture, traditional agricultural products in the Philippines. It's full of middlemen, um, uh, wrong direction, unsupported, wrong, wrong value chain. And I, co I commit myself to, to changing the whole thing. And no matter how I look, there's no change until we can make the front end producer better. So the front end producer is our farmers. 85% of our farmers don't even own their land. So I asked myself, how do you make them better? And again, I'm saying this with so much organized thoughts and ideas and everything. But as a young man, it was just one idea being pursued after another, after another. And so what happened there is I, I, we went directly to the farmers and I found out that even though we know technically how to grow and I have an agronomist and everything, at that time, we had 44% of the tobacco grown in the Philippines. That's, that's just how small our business was. And so we, everybody was through middlemen. And the middlemen were making the money, but they were taking the risk, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole concept of traditional agriculture and how we went to the next 10 years of blood, sweat, and tears realizing there's an agronomy part that needs to be learned more than just an agronomy part. How do you make that agronomy be appreciated by the farmers? You have to understand the socioeconomic fabric of every barangay that you work with. And from there, then you can start appreciating who is doing what and what, what is value. We ask our middleman to become our partners. They all left. It was too much work, they said. And so we went at it alone. One of the good things that I did at that time is that as a young man, that's so knowing, unknowing of IT is we went on a digital platform on, on, in 1998. And it was about seven, eight, ten, ten years of trial and error. And so what I, we learned is that my first 100 hectares, 100 farmers, not even 100 hectares, we were going through the field and sun was shiny. The river was gushing and right beside the river is our field and the, the, the plants were dying. So I said, why? Uh, Sir, walang water pump. Magkano water pump? At that time, our budget was 15,000 pesos per hectare. So as advances. Water pump and hoses is 15,000. So I said, begin mo. When I got back to my office, I said, what about the other 99? And so the whole, the whole balance sheet, the whole PNL, all of it completely changed. The problem with our traditional agriculture, it's always kulang, tipiran. And the, the middleman system, it's about gulangan, putakan. And so we took out middleman. We, we put in farmer leaders, all, all, all with the same direction properly find, uh, motivated and, and incentivated towards the right same direction. We put IT on every step of the way. We had agronomy, management, logistics, financials, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then fast forward, we now have 90 plus percent of all the tobacco grown in the Philippines in an industry that has been shrinking. All the big boys have left. And we, as a small boy, grew, and that is my 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 life's work. So it's all incorporated into an ERP. Everything, every part of our process is automated. All our farmers lead leaders have tablets. They have real time information of every single farmer. We have twenty plus thousand farmers that we contract directly, and they are globally competitive. We are the only traditional crop that was not afforded any safety nets. 
So imported tobacco from ASEAN is zero rated. In, in the beginning, I thought that was bad. At the end, that was the biggest thing that allowed us to grow because the people that, that did not evolve or innovated, basically they closed shop and we continue to innovate and grow. And in, even in industry, as long, as long as you think global, you can still continue to grow even in industry that has been shrinking for the past 15 years. So that is my story. And uh, I thank Rotary Club of Makati for welcoming me. And I'm looking forward to having great times together with all these guys here. Thank you so much. Wow. Winston, that is an amazing life story you have there. Winston, your sight may be impaired, but your vision isn't. Your vision of empowering farmers, that's very amazing. And that vision has not been impaired. So welcome to the club. You're a very good addition to our club. All right. Oh, okay. Committee announcements. Since I am the moderator, I might as well make a pitch for the Last Angel Project. Okay, September is about to end, and uh, we have two months to go till the start of this year's Last Angel Gift Giving Project. This is a project that was started by uh, a former person, Bryn Panlilio, to bring joy and cheer to children from needy communities. It has been a club tradition, and this year, as tradition goes, the immediate past president and the immediate first and test, we will be the ones who will be spearheading this project this year. So in behalf of our beneficiaries, Tess and I will be sending you love letters this early so that we could start buying gifts for the children. Apart from the traditional beneficiaries that we have like Rotary Homes, Stepping Stone, the Philippine Institute for the Deaf, some schools and some parishes, you may have beneficiary institutions in mind or areas that you want to be recipients for, our, for this year's Last Angel. In which case, all you have to do is to send us the list no later than the end of October, along with the profile and the ages of the recipients so we can tailor fit the gifts that we will buy for them. Last year, being still a pandemic year, uh, past President Peter Manzano and uh, Pam uh, donated mostly uh, hygiene stuffs apart from the uh, string, bags, string bags. But this year, because we went back face to face, Tess and I thought that it would be a good time to again uh, go back to our customary gifts of bringing toys so that it can definitely bring smiles and cheers to the children after being cooped up because of the pandemic. So I humbly appeal for your usual generosity and kindness to make this year's edition of The Last Angel as equally significant and memorable as the previous ones. Thank you very much. This month, is the uh, is the last meeting of the in the month of September, and what an uh, an appropriate way of ending this month, which carries the RI theme, education literacy, than having an educator and a dean as our guest speaker for today. So may I call on our president, or rather vice president, Hoi Kalieha, to introduce. Ah uh, no, wait. Ah uh, no, for the president's time. Sorry, for the president's times first. Pwede naman yan na uh, IPP Louie, Vice President's time. So, pwede naman tumaktaw muna. <laughs> so, good afternoon everybody. And uh, as already been stated, President Michael is in, uh, is in London. I think he's uh, going to greet the new king. So, maybe we will ask what his uh, agenda is when he returns. No, What was his agenda in London? Anyway, again, good afternoon everybody. Na for the next uh, three weeks or so, I will be the one uh, steering this club, and I hope to have your full support with it. I'm sure that we can uh, uh, 
give justice while uh, President Michael is not here. So we also have a good lineup of speakers just like today, but uh, we will announce them accordingly as the uh, dates nearby. Uh, we have our nutrition program on the way at uh, you know that this is one of uh, President Michael's focus, especially on child nutrition, particularly for children zero to three years old. Um, our biggest nutrition program is in Narvacan. I think uh, Winston also knows this, and he is a good beneficiary of uh, a good uh, donor, and we acknowledge him in this uh, project. His uh, company is matching the donation of RC Makati to complete the 700 funding program we need for this nutrition program. So thank you, uh, Winston. Uh, this uh, nutrition program is, of course, with our partner, RC Narvacan, the LGU of Narvacan, and the Southern Ilocos Medical Society. Um, we were supposed to go there. Um, I was uh, looking forward to fly in uh, Winston's uh, beautiful plane, but of course, the weather did not allow, but um, let us thank um, Ron, our Chief of Staff Ron, who went there to Narvacan and uh, represented us for that uh, nutrition, to the opening of that nutrition program. So salamat, Ron. Thank you, Ron, for that. Okay. Also, our rotor actors are here. Um, welcome and uh, thank you. We thank Director Julian Lim, for, uh, who is in charge of our rotor actors. They had their induction last September 17 at the RCM Clubhouse. So thank you. Director Julian, together with uh, the uh, Treasurer Tony, who assisted them in their induction. Treasurer Tony, thank you. Palakpakan naman natin si Treasurer Tony at saka yung ating mga Rotter actors there. <clears throat> okay. Um, also, our uh, our club was uh, recognized in uh, District 3830 for the mass induction and the TRF recognition at Soler. In terms of membership, we have eight new members. Uh, two was uh, inducted and six uh, on the way. So among those uh, present in that major affair is uh, and recognized in that event, PP Felix. PP Felix is here. Oh, there. And uh, and uh, Anne Tessie, PP Ruben, and Anne Mimi, Felix and Grace Ang, Eddie and Trina Galvez. Uh, President Michael also was there. Um, we also were also given due recognition for our Paul Hallis Society members, new Paul Hallis member society members, PP Reggie, P and Keith. Keith, congratulations, as well as the contribution to the end of our polio campaign. I would also like to thank the participation of President Michael, President, uh, President Nominee Keith, PP Reggie. Rotarian Boy and Porsche Peña, and of course, our Rotarian Winston Uy, who were those, who among those who were in the induction program. Congratulations again. Oh, ito, maganda na itong ating, ano, um, yung ating bowling team, almost won. <laughs> almost lang, almost. So, let us uh, congratulation our uh, bowling team. Headed by Captain Reggie Ponferrada, uh, Reggie Nulido, PP Carlo, uh, President Nomini Keith again, uh, Mr. Ro Don Rodrigo. Were you there? Or uh, I think if uh, Don Rodrigo was there, uh, we would have been number one. Sayang. No? <laughs> and Derek Tan, and of course, Carlo Ibanez. Of course, of course, we almost won, but that is the spirit there, no? joining. No? So. Thank you, and I think you are all healthy during that bowling tournament. Okay. And next, after the bowling, we'll have a basketball tournament. Uh, Director Sani Jr., uh, this now is your turf, but I was talking to Director Sani. Sabi niya, we only have one player for now or two. It's Director Sani and uh, Captain Reggie. So maybe any other Rotarians are willing to join the basketball team. I volunteered myself, but I told... <laughs> I told the uh, director, Sunny, after one shot, I will have to sit down already. So we need more members to play. So let us uh, keep uh, Rotary Club of Makati healthy and competitive. Thank you and good afternoon to all of you.
Thank you, Vice President Howie. Uh, sorry for skipping you a while ago after being away from the podium for three months. Medyo kinakalawag na ako. So, so now, okay, to introduce our guest speaker, the indefatigable, incomparable comrade, Boy Arteche. Buenas tardes a todos. Para mí es un gusto presentarle mi buen amigo Chel Jokno. Dean Chel is the founding dean of De La Salle University College of Law and chair of the flag group known as the Free Legal Assistance Group. Chel has been practicing law for 30 years and gained prominence as a human rights lawyer and a litigator. The De La Salle College, which opened in 2010, is the first law school in the Philippines to highlight human rights and legal aid as part of its educational program. Though already known in legal and human rights circles, Dean Chell gained wider public prominence when he ran on a platform of justice and judicial reform during the last 2019 senatorial election. Dean Chell emerged as one of the leading opposition senatorial candidates because of his connection with young voters who made sure that he consistently topped nearly all pre-election polls and service in schools and universities all over the country. Though Chell has no grandchildren yet, young Filipinos adopted Dean Chell as their law law. During the campaign because of his progressive stand on issues, his advocacy for youth empowerment, and his sweet remarks and occasional corny jokes. Even with the elections over, Dean Chell continued to engage with his children by serving as speaker for various events in numerous schools and organization all over the country. With speaking engagement, serving as a venue for continuing his advocacy for justice, human rights, and empowering the youth. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and in line with the belief of Dean Chell that justice should be accessible to every Filipino. He set up a free legal help desk on his Facebook page. In his first months, the help desk has helped several thousand Filipinos and many more. Chell was born on February 23, 1961, relatively a young lawyer. In Pasay City, the eighth of 10 children of Carmen Nena Icasiano and the famous human rights lawyer, nationalist, and former Senator Jose K. Pepe Jocno, known as the father of human rights and an intellectual oppositionist during the time of the first Marcos regime. Dean Chell completed his, fem, his primary and educary, educary, secondary education at the other school, De La Salle Green Hills. He earned his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Bachelor of Laws from one of the best schools, University of the Philippines, Diliman. And in 1986, he graduated Juris Doctor Magna Cum Laude from the Northern Illinois University. After passing the bar in 1987 in Illinois, and after the death of his dearly beloved father, he came back to the Philippines and took the bar examinations of 1988 and thereafter practiced his laws. Damas y caballeros, mi buen amigo, nuestro buen amigo, Jose Manuel Chel y Casiano Jocno. Maraming salamat, uh, Panyero. 
to your acting president, my good friend, um, Tony Howard Calieja, your immediate past president, Louis Aceoche, to your president and president-elect, I think who are not here physically, but I'm sure are here in spirit, Michael Escaler and Senen Matoto, to your past president, um, Fred Parungao, to all the other officers, directors, and as well, of course, to Attorney Boy Arteche, thank you for the wonderful introduction. To the officers and directors and advisors, and of course, to all the Rotarians who are watching online, as well as those who are here physically. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts on what I believe to be a very pressing concern. And that is the we face concerning disinformation in our country. Unlike misinformation, which is the spreading of false information without any to mislead, this information is the deliberate spreading of what we know to be untrue. In uh, the words of the older generation to whom I belong to, we call it propaganda. But nowadays, there are a couple of different forms of disinformation that we encounter. Alam naman siguro natin yung historical distortion or the way our history has been twisted out into so many different untrue forms. But there is also what we call fake news, news that is meant to mimic what we know as real news but is done in a way that is intended to mislead, to confuse, and to sow at least um, intellectual anarchy. And then you have the most recent phenomenon of deep fakes. These are defined as videos that are altered, I understand, using algorithms so that the person who you see on the video is not actually the person who was there in the real video. Unfortunately, our country is known, while it is known as the social media capital of the world, it is also known as ground zero when we speak of the global epidemic of disinformation. In fact, in a recent study by a Brussels-based marketing and advertising consultant named Sortlist, our citizens spend an average of 10 hours and 56 minutes, that's roughly 11 hours a day online. And of that number of hours, we spend hours and 15 minutes on social media platforms. You can imagine how powerful this information can be, given the fact that so many of us in this country really do almost everything online. We shop online, we learn online, we socialize online. Halos lahat na ay ginagawa natin in the virtual reality. Every single day, paid trolls distribute disinformation targeted at Filipinos and sometimes micro-targeted at specific segments of our population. These trolls bash, insult, discriminate, red tag, they breed hate and even violence. And the work they do can be extremely divisive, destructive, and dangerous. They create a chilling effect on free expression. How many of us who have been the subject of trolling or bashing think twice before we respond online or express ourselves online? And as we have seen, they can even impact on a free and fair elections which is really the heart of any democracy. But it's not only that, because this information is big business. I quote from a report by Channel News, a troll in the Philippines can potentially, potentially earn anywhere between 30,000 to 100,000 pesos. A month. That's roughly US 740 to $2,480 according to news reports in the country. 
that makes trawling financially lucrative compared with the average monthly wage rate, which was about 16,500 pesos across all monitored occupations and industries in 2020. But the pay trolls are just the low-lying fruit. The bulk of the money spent goes to what they call the architects of this information. By estimates of a De La Salle University professor, Jason Cabanes, around 75 to 80 percent of that money goes to the pockets of what he calls the chief architects of network disinformation. Who are these people? They're largely from the advertising, public relations industry, and retired or former journalists. One such architect of this information was interviewed by CNA, and she disclosed, she said, a minor social media engagement for a local client for, from a key city would could range from anywhere between 300,000 to 500,000 pesos a month. A moderate operation for a national client could range from 800,000 pesos to a million pesos a month. Moderate palang po yun. So a heavy engagement would probably cost much more. This information, therefore, is closely connected with corruption. Since politicians don't want to leave a paper trail, most of the payments made to trolls and to architects of this information are made in cash. And that cash has to come from somewhere, probably comes from somewhere untraceable. Question is, since this information has become so widespread in our country, can we fight it? And how can we fight it? Well, let's see how other countries have done so. And I think we can learn from them. One of the countries that has been very successful in fighting this information is Finland. In 2015, no less than its president challenged all the Finnish citizens, said, let's do something together about it. Finland mobilized its public and private sectors to fight this information by taking four basic steps. First, they brought in experts to teach them what's the problem, how do we deal with this problem of disinformation, and how do we develop strategies to fight it? Second, and I think this is very important, especially in our country, they reformed the country's educational system to really highlight create critical thinking, as well as to teach fact-checking and voter literacy. Third, and this is also important, aside from being anti-disinformation, they in Finland decided that we have to push a counter narrative. We have to find a narrative that is unifying rather than divisive. And they chose respect for human rights and the rule of law as the narrative that would counter disinformation. And fourth, they got together the schools, civil society, NGOs to play a major role in fighting disinformation. One school, for example, partnered with a fact-checking organization and worked with as young as elementary and high school students to learn about it. And this was not just a one-way experience. It's not only the students who learned how to fact-check, how to determine fake news, but they also employed their skills in social media platforms to help their partners figure out other creative ways to deal with the problem. The school director of that school explained, what we want our students to do is, before they like or share in the social media, they should think twice, who has written this? Where has it published? Can I find the same information from another source? The European Union has also done a lot as far as this information is concerned. In 2018, of online platform companies and players in the advertising industry in Europe agreed on a self-regulatory code of practice on disinformation. This is the first time this is the first time in the world that such a self-regulatory mechanism was created 
to deal with this information. This code of practice was recently strengthened. In 2018, those who signed on were Facebook, Google, Twitter, and Mozilla. In 2019, TikTok signed the code and uh, Microsoft as well. And just recently, they revised this to make it even stronger. What did they agree on? Well, basically, the following. To demonetize the dis dissemination of disinformation, ensure the transparency of political advertising, empower users, enhance cooperation with fact checkers, and provide researchers with better access to data. Taking lessons from these examples, I think there are many things we can do in our country to fight disinformation. First, we can call on our government to use its vast resources to combat all kinds of disinformation and to call out government officials who themselves engage in that unsavory practice. Second, we can work with students, student organizations, teachers, and school administrators to push back. Like the Finnish schools, we can partner with fact checkers and schools so that they learn innovative ways to fight disinformation. Third, and Australia has done this also recently, we can develop our own code of practice on disinformation so that those who I think will realize that it may be hard to pass legislation in our country to regulate this, at least we can come up with a self-regulatory mechanism that will deal with the problem. Fourth, in every way we can, big or small, we can expose this information we come across. We can be tools of discernment for the rest of the population. And fifth, we can and we should push educational institutions and even the Department of Education to strengthen critical thinking among our students, as well as voter literacy and fact checking. If the truth, as my father once said, is the power of the powerless, this information is the power of the powerful. Given the kind of in-your-face disinformation we are experiencing today, we need to have a truthful, compelling narrative that will push back. This information is destructive, but it's also a wake-up call. I don't think any of us can remain silent when the truth is at stake. We all have to step up, otherwise we will drown in the wastewater of historical disinformation and fake news. Because the truth is, the truth enhances us in a way that lies cannot. The truth is uplifting, it is empowering, it is inspiring. This information is deflating, discriminatory, and divisive. For us to live in solidarity with one another, for us to move forward as a people, we must live within the truth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Chell. Um, during the last elections, uh, Dean Chell has a very interesting tagline. Let's chill with Chell. Chell lang tayo, chill lang tayo ki Chell. So I hope you have some time for to fill some questions from the floor. So uh, probably I, I'll start things off. Uh, do you think, Dean Chell, that this information, this information contributed largely to the defeat of the opposition in last year's polls, in, in the last polls, rather. You know, or is it because the electorate's gotten jaded and weary about the uh, so-called obstructionist stance of the opposition? Or probably the previous administration was still getting high acceptance ratings till the very end. What do you think, Dean? There are so many factors that affect how voters vote. And this information is probably one of them. I wouldn't say it's the most significant factor, but definitely it was one of the reasons, perhaps, that the opposition lost. In any election, especially now nowadays, the opposition is always at a distinct disadvantage. And 
when you deal with a presidential election especially, you can imagine the amount of money and resources that goes down on the ground. So the question of disinformation, I think, is one factor. But as well, you have a disparity in terms of um, resources, disparity in terms of being able to come out on uh, national television and other mass media. Doon na malaki ang lamang siguro ng administration. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, P and Keith. Thank you. Very interesting. I heard you talk about trolls earlier. Why are we not able to arrest and find trolls and um, find them and also get from them their paymasters up the line and um, stop the practice? Prosecute. Thank you for that. Part of it, I think, is, is a lack of political will to do it. Second is we don't have the right legal framework because we don't have legislation that directly addresses the problem of trolls. In terms of technology, we actually have some technology that can trace the trolls. I understand that the social media platforms using the IP addresses block those that have multiple accounts, for example, in different social media platforms. But I think that there's a lot more that we can do, the government especially can do, to track uh, and hold accountable trolls if we just had the, the will and the bet a stronger legal framework to do so. Thank you. OK, who else has questions? Yeah, Rodrigo. Yes, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. And the, my question is, is, is any agency in the government or in the Senate or any bill actually looking into regulating this uh, social media demonizing of people or whatever they do? Uh, is somebody willing to do it or, or they are just uh, talking about that but nothing is happening? Because it reminds me of artificial intelligence. Everybody talks about artificial intelligence, but nobody's regulating artificial intelligence, actually. And it's very dangerous to jump into something that is not regulated because that can be used by the bad guys doing the wrong things. And I feel that this is something like that. Uh, technology is there, fantastic technology, et cetera, but it's being used for the wrong purposes. So is anybody addressing that in government? We have a law, the Data Privacy Act, and that created a National Privacy Commission. And I think that's one of the agencies that has been very proactive. But their jurisdiction is quite limited because it only refers to the violations of our personal privacy. So sensitive personal information, uh, people or companies that hack into that or give it away without our consent. There are also units in our law enforcement agencies. You have the cybercrime units in the Philippine National Police, National Bureau of Investigation. But again, they have a lot of limitations in terms of resources. And they are very, let's put it this way, sensitive to the political will or lack of political will. So if you are for seen, for example, as someone who is not allied with the administration and you are the victim of uh, disinformation, you can theoretically file complaints with them, but whether they will actually do a thorough investigation may be a totally different question. I think that the best way for us to go really is for uh, the private sector to push for a code of disinformation, like they've done in the European Union and in Australia. Because that way we don't have to wait for government to act and we can get the social media platforms on board, the tech people, the ad agencies, and, and everyone, civil society as well. And I, that's probably the most feasible way we can address the problem today. Yes, I, I was always also thinking about what penalties can be imposed to these people that are caught doing this. Is there any regulatory entity imposing those uh, penalties or, or or putting people behind bars for uh, you know doing these things or not 
Because if nothing happens, if there's not an, if there's not examples to be said, nobody will be scared of the of keep on doing things. There's actually an old law, which it makes it a crime to spread false news. They didn't call it fake news at that time. This law was enacted, I think, around 70 years ago. But it hasn't been used for online spreading of false, fake information. I myself actually am looking for an opportunity to test this law. Because Congress now has not, the recent Congresses have not passed any legislation on this matter. So in the meantime, you have sort of a vacuum and it's very difficult to fill. Who else has questions? Oh yeah, please go. From the Rotaract. John, right, John? Um, hello. Um, personally, as a student from UST Senior High School, how do you convince your fellow classmates, peers, or your friends to be alert and give care? for the threat of disinformation. Maybe you can work with your teachers, your school administrators, and partner with fact-checking organizations. We have two or three fact-checking organizations. I know one is based in UP, check.ph. There's also the Vera files. And working together, you might be able to, number one, help educate your classmates and other students in your school and also provide the fact checkers with um, more creative ways to fact check. So it's a two-way solution that you might want to consider. Tulad ng ginagawa nila, ang ginawa nila sa Finland. That's all. You mentioned uh, fact checkers, Dean. Uh, do these fact checkers themselves get their facts right? How do they, how do the fact have fact checkers vet themselves? What I understand is that they have very strict protocols that they must follow when they check the facts. So I would imagine that would include making sure that their sources are not fake themselves, using only materials from accredited websites and those that are based, let's say, in the academe, and as well um, making sure that before they approve anything, it goes through several, several layers of uh, fact-checking. The, the other thing that I think we need to do is to have more of them. Because as of now, I think we only have two or three in the country. That probably requires some funding as well, because it's not uh, easy to make sure that your facts are correct. Follow-up question to that, Dean. Um, the traditional media, and um, P.P. Carl Rupino would attest this, broadsheets have been trumped by trolls as uh, themselves so-called purveyors of, uh, of uh, false news. So how do you think traditional media and the broadsheets would be able to withstand this onslaught against them when it comes to uh, uh, being accused of being biased towards uh, certain certain issues, certain personalities? You know, that's a very tough question because before when we spoke of mass media, it was really broadsheets and the trad media that we talked about. But now that's really been overtaken by what you find on the internet. And it's not just the news media outlets on the internet, but pretty much the bloggers and the others who spread either real or, or, or fake news. That, I think, requires that the traditional media organizations find a way to reinvent themselves. I think that we are, the old concepts that we had about media are slowly but surely being cast yes. away. And we, they, they will have to find innovative ways to keep being relevant. And part of that would require as well an online presence, which I think most media outlets already have nowadays. Yes, most especially when information is just a click away that fast, huh? Past President Junjun? Uh, yeah, this question has to do with uh, Congress having the power to uh, give franchises to mass media. 
and we have seen the what Congress can do. You know, during the uh, lockdowns, they uh, went after the franchise of ABS-CBN. Uh, my question is, would you support a move to uh, remove that power from Congress? Because it is a very political body and they can use that in order to stifle, uh, you know, truth uh, by mass media. Yes, absolutely, I would. In fact, there was a decision that came out of our Supreme Court a couple of years back where one of our justices, I'm not sure if it's Justice Panganiban, uh, Chief Justice Panganiban, who said that um, it's about time we do away with the power of Congress to grant franchises. Because anyway, the regulatory side is not done by Congress. It's done by the NTC or other government agencies. And what has happened is that the granting or denial of franchises has become a totally political process, devoid of any other meaning, and may also as well give rise to a lot of money under the table. So I uh, do believe we should do away with it. Thank you. Past President Bimbo. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait for your mic. Bimbo. Thank you. Sir, uh, you mentioned uh, fact checkers, no? I think, uh, and uh, you just mentioned that they may need uh, funds to get bigger and stronger. I think that's definitely uh, needed. No, I've stopped forwarding all of the things I received, no? But really, I, I know only of that one from UP. So there are about three or four that are uh, reputable fact checkers already. Is that is that what you're saying? Or, I yeah. understand in that Facebook has two or three of them based here. I, I know of Vera Files and um, I think Grappler is another one. I'm not too certain of the second one. There is also the check.ph, which came out of the UP College of Mass Media. I'm not aware of other fact-checking organizations in the country. I think that would be a very required uh, su uh, su uh, support uh, from, let's say, Rotary, because I think that would be very neutral no? if we support some fact-checkers. So I think most of the people don't know who to go to uh, when it comes to wanting to or uh, forwarding uh, things we receive, no? because we receive tons of that. So I think that would be a good point to, to bring up and list all of these fact-checkers that are uh, reputable. No? Then second, uh, following the question of Rodrigo, so it's not a criminalized, it's not criminalized to, to forward fake news uh, because I guess that's the biggest thing. Legally, if there's no law that specifically says passing on uh, fake news is a crime uh, in, defined in, in actual um, practical terms of, of the internet now, uh, nothing will happen. Is, is, is there no bill trying to do that now or drafted uh, well, to criminalize exactly what trolls are doing? The only law that I know is already a law is that uh, particular article That's in the it. revised penal code, which only makes it a crime if you're spreading false information or false news that will injure the public interest. So that has that qualification as well. And there's no law I know of that specifically addresses online uh, distribution of uh, disinformation, especially one that has to do with elections. And I think we really need a law like that. Thank you. PP Cesar, would you like to ask something? Okay, any other questions? From yes, PP Benji. Can you please hand the mic to Benji? Attorney Kell, is there any um, merit in working with the uh, uh, the, the media themselves? You know, like um, <clears throat> you're talking Facebook, um, TikTok, uh, YouTube. You know, because I, if I recall, a few months before the elections, about 50,000 troll accounts were shut down by Facebook. But it was kind of too late. No? I mean, uh, if they were done way before, perhaps the, uh, they wouldn't have to done, be able to do all of that damage. No? Maybe um, is there any merit to working with this? It's just a few of them, no? but they control seven, maybe 90% of the media. 
Definitely. And that's why uh, coming up with a code of disinformation, which they will participate in, would be, I think, a very good step. I know that the Attorney General of the state of Washington, D.C., actually has a pending lawsuit against Facebook involving some issues that concern the distribution of fake news or disinformation. The problem I understand is that it's also the algorithms that they use, which tend to, once you are, once they know what you like, quote unquote, then you. that's what will come out on your feed all the time. And if you tend to like things where there is a lot of fake news subjects, which are the subject of a lot of fake news, then you'll be the recipient of a barrage of uh, disinformation. Now, to that extent, I'm not sure that these social media companies would be willing to alter that because that's where their profit uh, comes from. But nonetheless, there has to be some kind of regulation, whether it's self-regulation or regulation coming from the government. Well, Dean Chef, this goes into the concept of truth, no? The relativity of truth. Because uh, some of those who challenge deep-seated truths say that uh, that is a narrative, You're, you have a narrative, and that may not necessarily be the correct narrative. So how do you approach this? Uh, th those who wish to, in a way, revise history or uh, challenge some deep-seated truth to say that you know, about the concept of the relativity of truth. No, I, I think we can uh, learn a lot of lessons from the academe. Because when, for example, a student, let's say a graduate student writes a thesis and they check it, they verify the sources. And on that basis, we'll say whether that uh, is um, an accurate statement or not. And as well, issues of plagiarism. That's Donila Nalalaman kung plagiarized or him there. And that's, I think, the best way for us to be discerning in terms of um, what we see now in, in disinformation online. Because that is the most objective standard that we could employ. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yes. Uh, President uh, Nico of Rotaract. Good afternoon, Attorney Chair. So, uh, I'm, I'm proud of, to be your volunteer uh, last election. So, this is my question. It was only uh, based on my observation. For me, I think one of the main targets of the disinformation is the community's so lack of access in the technology. How can we deal with those kind of individuals, spe spe specifically the children. Yes, that's <clears throat> that's a very sad reality that it is uh, the, our children and those um, other sectors in our society that appear to be targeted by this. Actually, we began to notice more than 15 years ago that there were very deliberate attempts to rewrite history that started coming out in YouTube that were very well produced. Obviously, millions of pesos were spent producing them and that were targeted at the youth of that time who are now in the working class. And I think that's the type of, that's the worst type of disinformation. Because when you target young people who are 13 or 14 years old and you manage to influence their minds at that age, it's very, very difficult to reorient them at a later age. And that's why I have said that we have to come up with some kind of mechanism that will address the problem of disinformation. And we have to do it very soon. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Well, the Philippines was dubbed as the texting capital of the world, but now, as you said, being the ground zero for this information now, that is not a flattering moniker. So um, maybe uh, we can have uh, Vice President Hoi Kalieha deliver the response now. Thank you, IPP Louie. And then on behalf of uh, 
the Rotary Club of Makati. Thank you, Dean Chell. Uh, your speech and your talk on this information has enlightened us. And um, I think uh, on a personal note, uh, I don't know if a lot of you know, but I, I am also a uh, victim of deep fakes, especially during the last election. So, but then again, we're still here, still fighting and still push, pushing back. So I think what we learned today is that uh, there's a lot of uh, disinformation, a lot of kinds of trolls, a lot of kind of fake news. But then again, what are they stealing from us? They're not stealing money. It's not about money. It's not about power. But then again, in the end, they will be stealing the story of the Filipino people. And I think if they steal the story of the Filipino people, if there's distortion of our history, then there would be distortion of our future. I think that is what uh, today's message can be. And uh, we join uh, Dean Chell in the fight for the pushback of this information. Um, it would be difficult to fight, but it is also more difficult to fight if the disinformation comes from the government itself. But then again, the private sector, as we all know, is uh, bolder and stronger than the government because the power of the government emanates from the people. So dun po tayo. So again, we thank uh, Dean Chell. And um, I think uh, even if it's three years down the road, I think we will uh, hopefully see you in the Senate in 2025. So lahat po kami, suporta from now on. Uh, agahan kasi natin ang kampanya. Kayo naman, ano? hindi naman six months lang tayo magkakampanya. Agahan natin yung kampanya. And of course, to show our gratitude and thank for, uh, for being our guest speaker today, Dean Chell, we would like to present to you this plaque of appreciation uh, signed by uh, Michael Escaler and of course, uh, Bing Magtoto. There is also a note here. A, we will put this as a, uh, uh, in our reef buds. Narinig nyo na kanina yan, Dean Shell, but uh, this is presented to you for your being a speaker today for the Rotary Club Makati. Okay. And, okay. and of course, um, I know you have a lot to read, Dean Shell, but uh, in one of your uh, 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 me times, you can... Uh, take a look at our 55 years of service of Rotary Club of Makati, our coffee table book. Yeah. Yeah. At para naman masarap ang inyong pagbasa at uh, ang inyong pag-pushback, medyo lagyan natin ng konting vino. A little wine to drink while you are uh, looking at our coffee table book and fighting this information. Thank you again, Dean Chen. Ubusin oh. natin yung chat. So let's have a picture. Mr. Vice President, please adjourn this meeting. I call this meeting to adjourn. To adjourn, adjourn this meeting. <laughs>